Systems and the Crusader panel. Your panelists are Josh Mosquera, Kevin Martins, Paul David, Nicholas Chilano, Andrew Chambers, Nicholas Eberly, Wyatt Cheng, Travis Day, and Steve Shimizu. All right, good morning, BlizzCon. How are you guys doing? I brought the whole gang with me today because there's a lot of you guys out there and we have a lot of really cool things for you guys today. So what are we covering today? This is the gameplay panel. So yesterday we talked a lot about some of the big new features that you can expect with Reaper Souls, Adventure Mode, but today we're doing a deep dive on a few of the very core things that are at the heart of Diablo. And those start with epic heroes. So the guys here are gonna to talk to you guys about the Crusader, our knight in battle scarred armor, what was our process behind how we came up with his, with his skills, his look, how we fulfilling that fantasy. But the Crusader may be the star of Reaper Souls, but all of the five classes are getting brand new skills. And Wyatt here is gonna to talk to you guys about what you can expect. You guys are also gonna learn which of the five classes is Wyatt's favorite. So. But why do we play Diablo 3? Loot, right? At the heart of the Diablo experience is killing monsters and finding those awesome legendaries. And for us, a big focus on the expansion has been Loot 2.0. And really happy to sort of show you guys what you guys have in store in terms of Loot 2.0, how we're dropping fewer, better, and more epic legendaries. So to get this started, I'm going to have Kevin Martins, our lead game designer, come up here and talk to you guys about the Crusader. Good morning. So, nothing, there's not a single thing in the game that is bigger and more complex than a class for us. So you are the hero that has the, the last chance to stop death from wiping out all humanity, and we have to take that very seriously. Josh has this philosophy about expansions where he want the setting, the hero, and the villain to match up really well. Since these are inherently more self-constrained um, than the larger game, those things should be a great trifecta. So the Crusader was a great choice to balance against someone like Malthale. So who is the Crusader? When we set out to make a class, um, we have a few different questions we have to ask ourselves. And, and one of the most important ones is sort of where do they fit in that story? Um, where do they fit in the world of Sanctuary? And, and this is pretty straightforward. We had this, this vague idea, and most classes start with a very vague idea that, hey, we kind of like the Paladin. Um, could we bring something like that forward? And then when we put it through that filter, what Josh talked about, of matching the villain better, better, we talked about maybe having a dark Paladin. That handful of words um, eventually turned into something much grander. And we also had this idea that we wanted to broaden uh, the horizons of Sanctuary to make the world bigger by adding this class as well. So we took a lot of the things we loved about the Paladin and we did a lot of new things and that's where the Crusader came from. The Crusader and the Paladin Order are tied together. When the Paladin Order was first founded, Rackus, who became the first king of Westmarch, led the Crusaders west on a grand crusade, bringing the Zacharum faith by fire and sword. Meanwhile, the Crusaders, the elite force of the Paladins, went east on a secret mission. Now that the star has fallen and the dead have risen and Diablo came back to Earth and Malthael has arrived on Sanctuary, the Crusader has come back west to solve these problems. He's a member of the Zacharum faith, but he has never been corrupted. They have never given up their crusade, and they're going to solve this problem. It's a proper hero for humanity in this darkest hour. So the ideas really are very simple when we start off. And they're, they're, again, I mentioned before, they're very vague. So to sort of, if we have the knight in shining armor of a paladin, to have this knight in battle scarred armor, um, to make it sort of, it's not just darker, it's more appropriate to the times. If, if someone lives in eternal warfare, that's kind of where the crusader came from. Um, we also have this idea of righteous wrath. And when you see this word, watch how this influences all the skills, the weapons, the armor, the looks that we're about to show you guys as we do a deep dive into this class. That concept, it, it, it took a lot of life on the team, and you're going to see those words, righteous wrath, show up again and again. And essentially, this is scourging evil. Humanity has had enough. They are tired of being caught in the middle, and the Crusader is going to stop this once and for all. And then this is the core tactical concept. So if we have this idea of where they fit in the story, we have this fantasy of this, this knight in battle-scarred armor who has lived in eternal warfare, powered by wrath. 
Um, the War Machine Made Human answers the final question about classes, which is where do they fit in the tactical toolkit? We knew we wanted a heavily armored character, we knew we wanted a character who was melee heavy, but we also wanted to stand out from the barbarian and the monk. So this concept, you're again going to watch this idea, uh, if we took like a medieval battlefield engine, if we took a modern one like a tank, how can we turn that into something that you can actually play here today on the show floor? So to start that process off, this mid-range melee character, Paul David is going to take those ideas and show you um, how the art process begins so that we get the crusader you now see. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everyone. Um, so when we, f when we first set out to create the crusader, we, we established some early pillars to help define what the crusader is. Just as Kevin had mentioned earlier, these pillars are a knight in battle scarred armor, righteous wrath, mid-range melee, and a war machine made human. But what do these pillars mean? How do they help define the Crusader? And how do we visualize these ideas? Well, to help, an to help us answer those questions, we, we brainstorm. And brainstorming allows us to gather a bunch of different ideas to help, help us you know, imagine what these pillars are. Uh, the, the next slides I'm going to show you guys are a few examples of what came from that brainstorm session. Here we have a concept that focuses on shape language. Shape language is the overall simplification of the major elements down to basic geometric shapes. In, in this particular example, the rectangular shapes help, to help reinforce the idea of a heavily armored knight. Here we have a pair of concepts that really focus on the shield. Up top, you the shield takes center stage, suggesting the shield is a very important extension of the character. Down below, we have a, sh a skill concept that, that depicts a shield being used as a melee weapon. You can see the Crusader leap up in the air and come crashing down on his enemies. And here we have a plethora of armor designs. In this image, the, the artists explore the many different ways you know, uh, an armored knight could look like. There's also some play with some of the cloth, as you can see. And the cloth is there to represent the idea that the Crusader isn't, isn't purely melee, but he's also able to do some uh, magical abilities. At the end of the brainstorm, we gather all the ideas, all the elements, and we pick and choose the ones that really help support the pillars that we had established early on. These are the big, you know, the big bulky armor, the, the cloth element, the shield, the flail, and we take all those into concepting. Concepting is where we can take those elements and really refine them so we can um, you know, really figure out what, what this character should look like. Here we have a concept that, that incorporates the heavy armor and, and cloth elements. The, the cloth here has, has transformed into a, a tabard. The, t the tabard you know, suggests that he's, uh, he's a knight from an order and that he's also a, a magical user. Here we have a concept that really incorporates all the elements that we had established. He has a shield, the tabard, the big bulky armor, and the flail. And we really liked where this was going, so we, we went down this road and really explored what we could come up with. And this is, this is a take on that. You know, we, but this wasn't really quite hitting it for us. It's really at this point where you know, we, we know the elements that we want, but we, we really just need to figure out what they should look like. After many weeks of work and countless drawings, everything finally culminated down to this one image. This, for us, really represents what a crusader is in Diablo 3. Here we have a fierce battle-scarred knight with his flail and shield in hand ready to leap headfirst into enemies. From here we go into modeling. Now, for, with all the work that went into brainstorming and concepting, modeling was, was pretty straightforward with this character. One of the first things we do when we model is we block out the character. Blocking out the character allows us to get a feel for what the character looks and feels like in 3D and also allows us to assess the proportions to make sure that they're, they're where they need to be. Once we're pretty happy with you know, where everything is, we go into just straight up production. Here we can see the, the final gray model on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, you can see the many stages of texture completion. Once we're at this point, we, we, know we polish, we make the weapon, and we make the shield, and we have the final asset in game. Now, before I hand it off to our lead animator, Nick Chilano, to talk about animations, uh, here's a sneak peek at some of the armor sets you guys will be able to find for the Crusader in Diablo III Reaper of Souls. Thank you. 
Hey everyone. Thanks, Paul. So character and concept have really laid a great foundation for the Crusader. They've taken these key words, medieval, mid-range melee, uh, squared, um, a character that will hold his ground, and they gave it a face. Now it's the animator's turn to bring it to life. And we start with an idle pose. That idle pose is really going to capture the tone of the character. We started with, with this right here. Now, what we like about this is there's these squared shoulders and this broad chest. He's, he's militant and stoic, and he is not scared of the enemies in front of him. In theory, this is actually really great. We really dug this. But in practice, we ran into some issues. You're going to see here that he's going to go into dynamic action, but then he's going to hit this very rigid resting pose. It's causing visual noise. It's distracting to look at. So we got to kind of rethink this. The good news is that we can take this pose that hits a lot of these core elements of the Crusader and apply it to his town idol. So when you're talking to a vendor and you're in town, you still capture that element of the Crusader that we want. But now in game, you're more battle ready. Here, even without his weapons, he's a square, uh, mentioning the uh, shape language Paul talked about. And when you put it in practice, it flows much better. Now. It's fluid, it's dynamic, you're not distracted, and it feels really good. Once we've solved this issue, we can continue to animate more of his locomotion and his base moves and more weapons. But this time, we actually got asked to get involved in something that was new for the animators, which was the signature weapon. Now, when you started seeing the concepts of the Crusader with the shield, we always knew that was going to be a big part of him. But the flail really struck a tone with the team. It was medieval, it was mid-range melee, and it was very physical for a weapon. When it got in game, though, there were some issues with it. As you can see here, this is not reacting well at all. Uh, it's, it's just all over the place. It's got a mind of its own. So what we end up doing is we focus a lot of time now to make it feel right. Every, every click, every time we change gravity, physics, weight, or material, we have to then click 100 times to see how it reacts. And what you learn is, it's not about the action, it's about the reaction. So it's what the, the flail does after the movement. And I remember we had a meeting, and I went in there, and I was talking to my art director, and some tech leads, and I believe Andrew was there. And I said, all right, guys, we're either going to fail or flail. All right, I won't, I won't quit my day job on that one. I won't quit it. Um, but we ended up with something really good. And you'll see when you play it on the, on the showroom floor and in, in more videos that you won't even notice it. Uh, it's because it's, a, it's working how you expected. Now, finally, we get to the meat and potatoes for the animators, and that's the skills. Every hero has a style. The, the barbarian is very consistent. The monk hits and holds. And the crusader has a bit of a buildup to his animations. I'm going to show you a shield bash, and it's slowed down. And what you're going to see is you're going to see a character who really gathers that energy in the back, holds it, and then explodes forward. It's very physical. It's very powerful. And it's going with the line of action for the skill. Here at full speed, uh, you'll just see how powerful it really feels. The timing feels right. We're giving enough hold so that when he hits, it's really impactful. And this is when you get character, concept, animation, effects, and design really working together and you get skills that feel really good, they're really fun, and they look really awesome. Now, to talk a little bit more about designing the skills for the Crusader is our senior designer, Andrew Chambers. All right. How you doing, BlizzCon? You liking what you're seeing? Yeah. Nah, it's not loud enough. Louder. Yeah. Love it. I love you guys so much. You know what, afterwards, if you see me on the floor, just come up and give me a hug. Just hug me, especially you, because I love those big bear hugs, you know, just come up and give me some love. All right, so it's looking fantastic, right? These amazingly, phenomenally talented artists bring words on a page into life on a screen in an amazing way. So special to work with these guys. On the design side, our challenge is figuring out, how does this guy play? You know, when you're clicking the button and like slaying evil, what's the tempo behind it? Is it like smooth jazz? Or is it hard ah, drum and bass? So we knew straight away 
that he had to be a melee character. He's this big guy in armor with a shield and a flail. There's no way he's walking away from a fight, and he likes to be up close and personal. But we can't just add another melee character to Diablo 3. We have two very strong classes in the Barbarian and the Monk that really own that space really well. So for the Crusader, brand new class for Reaper of Souls, we gave him the ability to have some strong range component to him. A lot of his skills have the ability to slay from afar. Part of the key for that was allowing him to be powered by this righteous wrath. Wrath is your resource. It ambiently generates even when you're not in combat because he's so mad that there's so many demons out there and he can't get to them yet. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, he can generate it with his primary. He spends big with his secondary skills like Shield Bash that you just saw. But the great thing about it being Wrath is it's not necessarily physical. It's this mystical power that he has inside of him. And he can choose to unleash it in any way, shape, and form. And he does. So now that we have the, me the melee and range thing established, how do we like, explore that? We start with some skills. This is Slash and Shield Bash. Charges in, slams his enemies with his shield, empowering it with his wrath, and slashes the air in front of him with holy fire. Very melee. The great thing about his melee skills, the Crusader is often wearing a shield, so he won't be out of dual wield. That's okay, because for a lot of his skills, they're very AoE oriented which actually makes up for the fact that you can't necessarily uh, flail around really fast, but you can hit lots of monsters at the same time. So that's great, melee. Tick. How do we do the range? This is Justice and Blessed Shield. He hurls a hammer! Slamming into his enemies and exploding with holy fire. And charges up his shield and throws it at them. Ricocheting around. Crushing everything in his path. The fantastic thing about the Crusader's ranged abilities is not only do they give him the ability to kill things from afar, they also have this fantastical physical component to them. You'll see it's, there's no fluffiness here. He's angry, he's wrathful, he's righteous, he's a knight. He really kills things really well. <laughs> and even his range skills have this great sense of like strength behind them. So now that we have the two gameplay roles established and understood, the next thing we need to do is go ahead and fill out the rest of the skill kit. We don't, unfortunately, start with just 24 skills. We have to, you know, come up with that on the design side. So, Sometimes, we're not successful. This is a crushing result. Uh, who here played a paladin in D2? Yeah. So you know zeal, right? Zeal was an amazing skill. It increased the number of monsters it would hit as you used it. It increased your attack speed, scaled with attack rating in fantastic ways. So we decided this guy's, you know, descended from the Paladins, so let's bring that skill forward and give it to him. Unfortunately, it didn't work too well. In Diablo 2, you have two skill buttons, effectively. In Diablo 3, we're so much better, you have six! You have all these utility skills that you want to, like, use. Um, you want to, like, have spenders and generators and all this kind of thing going on at the same time. When you have one skill that does as many things as zeal in that kind of context, it can actually get a little bit sad. Because you're just pressing one button all the time. You have no incentive to press anything else. We compound so many things on this one skill, that becomes all you need to press. Also, the visuals aren't really reading terribly well. It's kind of hard to tell that it actually increases the number of monsters only to five. The buff is a little bit sort of strange and persistent because it's always there. So you won't actually see this on the Crusader. You won't see it on the floor, you won't see it in Reaper of Souls. The great thing about this is we iterate, we learned a lot. This actually became Slash, and Slash has a rune on it called Zeal. So kind of win-win. Sometimes, lightning strikes.
This is Fist of the Heavens. Boom! Oh! Yeah! Louder! <laughs> The Crusader is a knight in battle scott armor. This righteous warrior, so empowered and so powerful. He's this immovable force, an unstoppable object. When he commands, the heavens respond, and they give him this. Yeah, we call this an epiphany skill. This is the first pass implementation of this skill. Like, we haven't changed it since we tried it out. Very first, we saw it in game, we knew it resonated so strongly that we had to just keep it, and we haven't had to iterate on it. It was that good. The great thing about Fist of the Heavens, mechanically, is it comes from the sky. As a Crusader, I want to be surrounded by enemies a lot. A lot of my utility skills, like Provoke, actually increase their potency based on the number of monsters I, uh, that I hit. And the, my, the, the, the radius is actually around me. So when you're surrounded by enemies, and you really need to kill that treasure goblin that's over there, you need that. It comes from the sky. Thank you. So up next is Nick Eberly, technical artist, to take you through even more iteration of our skills. Thank you very much. And you big guy, don't forget the hug. Oh, that one. Yep, there we go. Hi, everyone. So the first thing we do when we're designing a new class on Diablo 3 is we ask ourselves the question, what's the fantasy for this character? So we brainstorm and come up with all kinds of different ideas and fantasies we want to see for the Crusader. Uh, so I'm going to show you today kind of how I take those fantasies and bring those to finished skills. The first skill I'm going to show you is called Heaven's Fury. The fantasy we started out for this was we wanted to see the hand of God reach out and destroy the Crusader's enemies. And we thought that sounded really cool. But then we had to figure out, well, what does that do? And you know, what does it look like? So this is the first version of Heaven's Fury. Mechanically for this, you would right-click and drag out a line, and then these beams would come raining down, you know, destruction on the battlefield. And, you know, visually we liked it. We thought it looked pretty cool, but it had, it had some problems. It was, it was really loud. Like, if you were in a multiplayer game and your buddy was casting this, that's all you saw, so it was kind of annoying. So we uh, kind of kept making some revisions. For this version, the, we had the beam chase the mouse cursor around. And we really liked the way it looked. We thought it, you know, it felt really powerful, but didn't take too much space up on screen. But mechanically, it was a little rough. We didn't like having a channeled skill for the Crusader. You know, we want him to be able to move around and you know, hit things. So we thought, well, what happens if we gave you know, the skill its own AI? So this is our final version of Heaven's Fury. You can see, you, you right-click, the beam goes out, it chases down monsters leaving the Crusader free to smite his enemy, throw his shield at him, while Heaven's Fury melts faces. Nice. Alright, so a knight in battle-scarred armor. You know, every class needs a movement skill, though. So we kind of asked ourselves the question, you know, what's, what's a knight without his horse? As a steed charge. Crusader summons a mystical horse, just cruises around the battlefield. It's really, really fast. Has some really awesome runes, too. Just definitely uh, give that a try. War machine made human. So we talk about the Crusader being like a you know, big Abrams battle tank. I mean, you know, one of the coolest things about a tank is, you know, the big gun on top. So we didn't want to give the Crusader a gun. That that's, doesn't fit his kit. But we asked ourselves the question, well, what if he was the artillery shell in that cannon? This is Falling Sword. Crusader jumps up into the air, crashes down, doing tons of AoE damage. Really helps him get into the fight, if there's anything left. When after that hits. A lot of times there's not.
so he's, he's descended from paladins. And, you know, I'm sure you know, a lot of us D2 paladin fans. That was, that was my first character I ever played in D2. So there was one skill we had to bring forward. <laughs> Hammers? So really an iconic skill for the Paladin. And you know, we had to bring that forward to D3. You know, he summons his hammers, they, they swirl around him, you know, piercing through everything, just laying waste to the battlefield. Lots of fun. All right, I just want to show you a little video of the Crusader. It's got a bunch, uh, bunch of new skills. There's some, some runes in there if, you're, you know, if you look carefully. Here we go. Uh, thanks, guys. I hope you enjoy the Crusader as much as we do. Now, let's talk about the rest of the classes. Wyatt Chang. Thanks, Nick. Hello, BlizzCon. That Crusader is looking pretty awesome, isn't he? I think that's going to be my new favorite class. But, of course, it wouldn't be right to work on Reaper of Souls without also visiting the five original classes that came with Diablo 3. So I want to talk about changes that we're making to the original classes. As we sat down to look at those classes and what changes we wanted to make, the team really believes in focusing on the fantasy. What that means is that every class represents a classical, strong fantasy archetype. And any changes that we make should play into that fantasy and reinforce it. We went over all of the existing skills and runes, as well as every class in Reaper of Souls is going to get a new skill. I'm going to take you through all five classes, and we'll highlight what their new skill is going to be. Let's go ahead, we'll go ahead and get started with my favorite class, the Barbarian. The Barbarian exhibits physical strength. Obviously, Unlike the Crusader, who's heavily armored, the Barbarian focuses on his connection to the ancients, his physical strength. We have a, a theme of earth and might coming through. Earth and might refers to his ability to like, use boulders or rocks or cause seismic activity. This is exhibited in skills like seismic slam and earthquake. Of course, we feel some skill, those skills, seismic slam and earthquake, weren't quite performing as well as they were, so they're getting some huge buffs in Reaper of Souls. And his new skill is called Avalanche. Avalanche will allow him to let out a huge roar and call down a huge pile of rocks and debris to fall from above. Here's a video of what that looks like. Avalanche is currently on a 30 second cooldown in internal builds, but the way we have it set up is the more fury that you spend, it reduces the cooldown on the skill. So if you have a build that spends a lot of fury, you can actually use Avalanche more often. Up next is my favorite class, the Wizard. The Wizard is a powerful range caster. We all know this is a really strong fantasy archetype that's been around for years, decades. A lot of people want to play the Wizard as a glass cannon, clearly an elementalist. You probably know in the live game, there's elements like frost and lightning and fire and arcane. Of course, arcane gets a little more attention and fire, lightning and cold could serve to be played up a little bit more. And that's one of our focuses for the Wizard and Reaper of Souls. If you want to play a fire, frost or lightning elementalist wizard, now you can. We're looking at a lot of existing skills like spectral blade and magic missile. Magic Missile is getting a rune variant that will actually allow it to do cold damage. And it's, 
And as we were looking at Arcane Orb, it gave us an opportunity to pay homage to one of my favorite D2 skills. In D2, you had Frozen Orb. And here's what that looks like in Diablo 3. But as promised, every class is also getting a new skill. And the wizard's new skill is called Black Hole. Black Hole pulls in all the monsters, CCs them, and deals a huge amount of damage in that targeted area. This really allows you to play up that fantasy of being a ranged glass cannon. You can use crowd control skills and still dish out a lot of damage. And nothing sets up the perfect meteor better than Black Hole. Yeah! Let's talk about my favorite class, the Monk. The Monk is a martial artist. Unlike the Crusader, who's heavily armored, and the Barbarian, who's physically strong, the Monk's core fantasy is to be fast and agile. He also incorporates elemental. He's an he's a, a elemental bender. He integrates fire and lightning. But of course, what we really want to play up is this sense of mobility. The monk should be the fastest character on the battlefield. This didn't quite play up as well as we wanted it to on the live game. So in the expansion, we're making changes to skills, like Fist of Thunder Thunderclap is the most popular rune on live. And one of the reasons is because it incorporates a teleport into its ability. So I'm happy to say that all rune variants of Fists of Thunder will be teleporting you directly to your opponent. We're also looking at skills like Dashing Strike, which was really kitted to fill that fantasy of the fast monk, but for a number of mechanical issues, wasn't used as much as we'd like. So we're reworking its mechanics. One of our goals, although we don't want you to be able to teleport indefinitely, we definitely want it so that if I click on an empty location, I should just go there. And of course, we're going to be looking at seven-sided strike, which is another key skill that makes you feel like you're fast and teleporting all over. And his new skill is called Epiphany. Epiphany, once activated, allows all of your melee attacks to teleport you directly to your target. Let's take a look at that. These are some normal melee attacks. And here I am, I pop Epiphany. Everything I do takes me straight to my opponent. It doesn't matter if you're casting Lashing Tail Kick, Wave of Light, Deadly Reach. No one can get away from you. Every ability you do teleports you directly into your opponent's face. Oh, my favorite class, the Demon Hunter. The Demon Hunter's fantasies are clear. Ranged weaponry, a deadly assassin using shadow energy and traps. One of the fantasies of, the, of this trap, you know, demon hunter wasn't played up as well as we thought. Skills like spike trap get used more as ranged damage dealers than a trap. So we're looking at skills like spike trap and sentry. We really want players to be able to play in a way where they say, hey, you know what, I want to set up a little, you know, my home, my nest, and lure enemies into it and have them all just, you know, mercilessly die. But at the end of the day, the Demon Hunter is a ranged class. And her new skill will play into that. The Demon Hunter is getting a skill called Vengeance, which allows every single attack you do to fire off even more ranged weaponry. Let's see what that looks like. I pop Vengeance. And now every attack I do fires additional shots. You got rail guns out the side, rockets coming out in all directions. Pew, pew, pew! Pew, pew! <laughs> Last but not least, my favorite class, the Witch Doctor. The Witch Doctor, his aesthetic and theme is really, really strong. He's got zombies and the fetishes. 
We're really happy, actually, with the way the aesthetic of the Witch Doctor plays out on live. But unfortunately, although the aesthetic is strong, his mojo, the mechanics aren't all there. In particular, one of the fantasies of playing a Witch Doctor is to be a dot class or a pet class. And although the pets will tank with you, they don't do enough damage. And although the dots are there, they're not worth using. We're going to be making huge improvements to Haunt and Locust Swarm. One of his new passives, make his dots last for five minutes. <laughs> totally balanced. <laughs> and we wanted his new skill to play into many different play styles. So for inspiration, we drew upon Diablo II's Amplify Damage. Amplified Damage is a great utility spell, but it's not super flavorful. It's a great mechanic, but there's not a cool aesthetic to go for it, and we have to pair those up. So I was talking to our, uh, one of our lead technical artists, Julian Love, and he was saying, you know, he's got all these cool creatures like the bats and the frogs. I mean, when it comes to voodoo creatures, how far can we push this? Can, could we do piranhas? Why, yes, we can. <laughs> you can actually see the piranhas stuck to the monster. As a visual indicator, it's not just awesome to look at, it lets you know that's a, damage of, that's a monster affected by the amplified damage effect. That monster is going to take more damage from all sources. Of course, this begs the question what lies below the surface of the water. You guys want to see that again? Yeah. Um, num, 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 num. So good. So good. So let's talk about items. One of the requests we got a lot for items is a way to modify the items that you find. So the new artisan in Reaper of Souls is the Mystic, which will allow you to do exactly that. The Mystic allows you to modify any item that you find in one of two ways. You can either change the way it looks, or you can change, and you can also change a property on an item. Transmogrify allows you to take your Crusader, who may look like this, <laughs> and look like that. And then enchanting allows you to choose any property on an item that you don't want and ask the mystic to re-roll it. She'll offer you three new randomly generated properties for you to choose from. And for gold and reagent cost, you can repeat that process as many times as you want. The enchanting process also works on endgame legendaries because we want to make sure that the golden item it acts as an, an effective golden item sync for the endgame. Here's a video of that. Like I said, you take an item and you hand it to the mystic. The mystic will present you with a choice of properties that you want. I should mention that one of the three properties is actually the original property of the item, so you can never make the item worse. You can always fall back on the property that was there before. And like I said, you can go ahead and do the enchanting process as many times as you want. And to talk more about items, I'd like to bring up our game designer, legendary game designer, Travis Day. How you doing, BlizzCon? So who here came to listen to us talk about Loot 2.0? <laughs> Joke's on you, I'm talking about hair care products. So going into Reaper of Souls, uh, we sat down and we talked a lot about the things that we liked with our item game, the things that we maybe wanted to, <clears throat> to improve upon, uh, and we came up with really three 
big philosophy changes that we wanted to make moving into the expansion. The first one was less is more, items support builds, and rarity equals power. Uh, less is more was just our way of saying we want to make sure the players find awesome items and we don't want to flood the screen with them because we felt like we just dropped too many things and most of them weren't as good as they could have been. Opening presents is supposed to be fun, but when you've opened up 20 pairs of socks, it gets pretty disappointing. Item support builds. Um, this was our way of just sort of embodying the idea that we really wanted the items to feel like they changed the game. We wanted them to be more than just math problems that you had to look at arrows to figure out. So going into the expansion, we've added a lot of new affixes and legendary effects to sort of embody that. And finally, rarity equals power. Uh, this was our way of expressing the idea that it's okay for things to be rare. It's okay for legendaries to not be flooding the screen and all over the place. But when you find them, they've got to be really awesome. And we felt like we had a lot of work to do in that department. So some of the things we've done to uh, address the less is more philosophy is we implemented what we call the smart drop system. The smart drop system really is just our way of going, hey, you're a barb you probably want some barb items. You probably don't want a quiver, and you definitely don't want int on the quiver. <laughs> so when we drop items in the game now, we, we have behind the scenes a system running that periodically is just gonna go, hey, okay, you're, you're gonna get a sword, it's gonna have strength, you're gonna be happy, who's ah? Another thing we did to help with dropping less items and making them better, um, we reduced the random range on our affixes. If a lot of you remember back uh, when we shipped the game, you could find items that had 100 strength or one strength. And we kind of went, that's a little bit excessive. We don't need it to be that random. We love random, it's at the heart of Diablo, but there's degrees and we can narrow that down some. So instead, you'll find things in make-believe number land of 75 to 100 strength. So you can still find things that are better or worse than what you have, but they won't be offensive. <laughs> uh, one of the last things we did to sort of help with the less is more philosophy, um, we sat down and we talked about a lot of our stats, and we did this for a while. We said, you know, there's some great stats in our game, and then there's some others that are not so great. Um, and I love finding pickup radius, and I love finding bonus experience and wearing it, but I'm not going to wear it instead of strength, or crit, or attack speed, or whatever other number of trifecta stats. So we said, hey, what if instead, what if we just break these stats out? What if we acknowledge that these stats are cool, but they're not going to help you kill monsters better? So what we did going into Reaper of Souls is we've separated the item stats into what we call primary and secondary. And any item is going to have a fixed number of primary stats and a fixed number of secondary stats. So you can have magic find, but it doesn't cost you crit. Here's a couple examples. You can see the boots have int and vit and resol. And then you also get magic find and bonus experience, and it didn't cost you the stats you wanted. Another thing that we wanted to address moving into the expansion was we wanted the items to really be exciting. We wanted you to find items and go, holy crap, I'm totally going to change my character for this. Or, hey, I found some items that really work with the skills that I like using. We wanted them to encourage diversity so that not everyone would be a whirlwind barbarian. Here's a couple examples of that. We've got a helmet that increases energy twister damage by 14%. And we also have an axe, which reduces the cooldown of all your skills. So these are just a couple examples of the kinds of affixes we've been trying to introduce to the game so that players can find things that really suit their play style and encourage them to try out things they maybe wouldn't have thought of. And finally, rarity equals power. This was really just our, uh, our sort of notion that We've got this item progression, and it makes sense for most of the game. You go from gray items to white to blue to yellow. But then it starts to get pretty fuzzy when you get to legendaries. Legendaries are really hard to find in our game. And we used to get a lot of feedback like, man, why are legendaries so rare? I never find any. And what the people were really saying is, 
why do they suck? Why can't they be better? So we wanted to sort of deliver on this fantasy that the harder it was to find something, the better it was going to be. So it felt like it deserved to be as rare as it was. Uh, and to talk about some of the specifics of what we're doing with Legendaries in the expansion is lead gameplay programmer Steve Shimizu. Thanks, Travis. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I am going to talk for a few minutes about legendary items. Um, but the first thing I want to say is I do recognize that there are people out there that might, may have played Diablo 3 for 30, 50, even 100 even 100 hours, and never found a legendary. So maybe you're thinking, oh, this section isn't for me. I never find these things. Well, we have a new philosophy for the expansion, end game for everyone. So we'll be changing the system around such that everyone has a, has a reasonable chance of finding these items. Now, that being said, uh, legendaries and set items are by far our most rare type of item. And in keeping with what Travis was just saying, rarity equals power, they should also be the most powerful items as well. Now, this is something that we didn't deliver on with the launch of Diablo 3, but it's something we are very much looking to fix for the expansion. <clears throat> so, specifically, what are we going to do? How are we going to fix that? Let me start by talking about... Whoop, wrong button, sorry. Let me uh, start by talking about how we're going to improve some of the classic legendaries that are already in the game. So after the 2.0 patch comes out, we're going to be dropping new versions of each of these legendaries, and these new versions will be, have been addressed in three different ways. Uh, first, uh, drops at monster level. What does that mean? Well, currently every legendary in the game drops at one particular level and one particular level only. In Reaper of Souls, that item can drop at every level, every level from then on. So for example, you might have a puzzle ring that drops at uh, 32. Um, that, that item can also drop 32, 33, 34, all the way up to level 70 with stats that are appropriate for that level. Speaking of stats, we're going to be doing a stats pass on all of the items to make them viable. Again, rarity equals power. They should be the most powerful items in the game. The stats should reflect that. But finally, we are also going to be looking into adding new powers to many of these legendaries. It should be not only good from a stats point of view, but to make them unique from a utility point of view, give them powers that you don't see anywhere else in the game. So let's take a look at an example. These are the Frostburn Gauntlets. On the left is an example from, that's currently in the live game. On the right is an example from Reaper of Souls. So first, first point drops at monster level. Previously, this item would only drop at eye level 62. Now it can drop at 62, 63, 64. And in the example here, this is a level 70 version of this item. Um, stats pass. So we've done a stats pass on this item. You'll notice that we've added primary stat to it, in this case, intelligence. It's got way better stats. It's a much more viable item. Uh, I want to draw your attention to these gray numbers on the, on the right there. This is a new feature we've added to 2.0. Um, you highlight any item with the mouse, you hold down the control key, and these gray numbers will come up. What are they? they? They show the possible range of random values that you could have gotten for each affix. So, so this is something we added because you know, we want people to understand the items better. We want everyone to be able to understand you know, sort of the item space and what's going on there. Um, but I, I, brought, I, I showed these up here because I wanted to point out intelligence. And in the worst possible case, in the worst possible role you could get is 750 intelligence on this item. So it's still a really, really viable, viable item, even, even if you get a really bad role on intelligence. And this represents a philosophy shift in that, you know, if you're lucky enough to get a legendary item, you shouldn't have to be extra lucky on top of that multiple times in order to have a viable version of it. <coughs> So the last point here is this affix in orange here. Um, this is a new power we've added to this item and didn't have it before. This one says your chill effects have a 50% chance to freeze instead of slow. So what does that look like? This is a, a wizard using Ray of Frost. Ray of Frost normally just chills and slows the enemies, but because she's wearing this item, she can freeze them in their tracks. <coughs> so. 
So really, this is where a, a large part of our item development is going for the expansion, is into the creation of these new affixes that change the way that you play the game. So I'm going to close out this panel by going over just a few examples of some of these powers that we've been working on. Uh, first up, the Haratunian Arm Guards. Again, uh, focusing on the affix in orange. It says, every time you destroy a wreckable object, you gain a short burst of speed. So what does that look like? Um, in this example here, I'm pairing it with classic Firewalker boots, which kind of destroy things around me. So every time I get near one of these gravestones, I just get a little short burst of speed. So this sort of really changes the way that you kind of look at the environment and look at the game because, you know, you may not have noticed all the wreckable objects in the environment before, but now that you have this item, you definitely will because you'll be steering toward them to get that little burst of speed. Um, next example, the illusory boots. Again, the orange affix. You may move unhindered through enemies. So what does that mean? It means you have the freedom to just run right through enemies. So I could see this being like a like a valued hardcore item maybe where getting surrounded might be the end of your character or you know I guess some of the point there is too that you know we want you to be able to look at your hot bar after getting an item and, and think hmm maybe I don't need vault anymore maybe I don't need some escape skill anymore because this item is taking that taking that ability for me. So some of, the, some of the new powers that we're making will actually modify skills that you already have. So in this case, this is a witch doctor mask. Uh, witch doctors have a skill called Horrify. Horrify is a, uh, a one-shot AOE fear. You, you hit it and everyone runs away from you. In this case, this item will change Horrify. It says Horrify causes you to fear and root enemies around you for eight seconds. So instead of a one-shot fear, watch, he'll pop for Horrify. And it'll follow him around, and he can just stun enemies around him, and then just finish them off with his other skills. So, <laughs> some items we're doing just because we we think they're cool to do. Um, this is in an homage to an item from another popular online game. Uh, <laughs> this is what it looks like in our game. So every time the wizard attacks, she's got a chance to proc this cool chain lightning effect to help her dispatch her enemies. So my final example uh, is a set item example. Now we recognize that set items are going to be among the most difficult, the most rare to, to get the powers from because you need multiple items of the same set. Um, but in keeping with rarity, what rarity equals power that Travis was talking about again, uh, we're saving some of the be better skills for uh, set item bonuses this time around. So in this case, this is a, a demon hunter set um, with a temp name, <laughs> don't worry. Um, and uh, the two set item bonus is your spike traps lure enemies to them. So this really increases the utility of spike traps. So now you can really control where they're going. You see, notice every time she sets a spike trap down, it'll taunt the enemies to it. So that's all the legendaries we have for you today. Back to Josh. Thanks, Steve. All right, Bless Collins. So what do you think of those legendaries? Yeah. Awesome. What about the Crusader? Yeah. And the Piranhas? Very yeah. really awesome, right? So again, really happy to be here. As you can see, we put a lot of blood, sweat, and tear, and our passion into Reaper Souls. I mean, the new class looks fantastic. The new act, Adventure Mode, Loot 2.0. We really feel that we're, we're on, the, on, the, on the eve of a new era for Diablo. And really, we thank you guys for playing our game, being here. And I think we may have a few minutes for some questions. Are we good to go? Hey guys, um, again, thanks for all the awesome work. 
Uh, my question is around the stats um, and basically how large the numbers are getting, the World of Warcraft inflation. Um, are you guys concerned about that at all? What we're hitting things for like 2 billion crits if the numbers are just going to get too large at some point? It's, it's, um, it's, it's a tricky balance. I mean, obviously with the large numbers, um, it, it can also be hard to process. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not worried about it yet. Um, it, it's, it's a concern we might have if uh, maybe, maybe in like eight, nine years. I love big numbers. I just want to say I love big numbers. Hi. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you guys because me and I know a lot of other people here played a ton of D2 and were really excited for D3 and there was a lot of very, very harsh criticism that was leveled against D3 and all of the work that I see that you guys are doing to address that criticism and make it better is fantastic. So thank you guys for that. Thank you. Um, my question has to deal with a question that I asked actually a couple years ago at BlizzCon. I asked about Arcane Sanctuary was my favorite level from D2, and the art style in particular was completely different from a lot of things that were in D2. And when I saw your panel yesterday on some of the things you're doing with Reaper of Souls, in particular that one set of concept art that had the big blocky figures and the, it was like a space theme. It had a whole bunch of stars. I was like, that, that's what I wanted two years ago. And you guys were kind of like, no, nah, that's not really fitting with what we're doing right now. And now that I've seen that concept art, I want that. Oh, I want that. And I don't know what kind of stage you guys are in development at this point, but could you uh, give me a little love? Arcane Sanctuary, you, you built it for me. So you built um, it. <laughs> we're, not, we're not just flat out going back to Arcane Sanctuary, so I'll tell you that cool. right now. There's the bad news. The good news is um, we do like that level too, and um, Pandemonium Fortress specifically has a bunch of Arcane Sanctuary-inspired aspects to it. Um, so we, sh we showed just a tiny glimpse of it in the video yesterday, which I'm sure you can review again on YouTube. But when you actually see the fortress level, um, there's a bunch of stuff in there. And let us know how you think we did once you get to play it. Perfect. Thanks. How you doing? Uh, one of the coolest things in Diablo 2 is when you had every set item, your appearance would change for some of those sets. Um, any plans in Diablo 3 if you get every set item to give some kind of aura or an appearance change so everybody so you know and everybody knows you have every set item right right <laughs> um, you haven't talked about anything like that yet uh, it's not a terrible idea though it could happen um, no promises but um, we're really putting a lot of our focus right now onto trying to get the set items to just feel like they were worth the effort they took to get. Um, so we're trying to make the bonuses as crazy as possible without breaking the game completely. Um, one of our mantras around the office has been game changing, not game breaking um, with our items. So it's, it's totally possible that we could add visual components to some of the set bonus powers. Um, I don't know that we would necessarily want to take that and apply it to everything in the game. Um, but it's not impo totally impossible. I, I, I meant if you, have, if you had every item in that set, not necessarily a visual for just a single item. Uh, yeah, I, th I think, um, as we were saying before, a large part of our item development budget is going toward the creation of those powers, right? And everything's a trade-off in development. Um, and so, honestly, if it were c I understand the coolness of that. I also understand how rare it is, and, and that's why it's cool. But on the other hand, you know, if I had if I had a tech artist's time to do to do that sort of thing, I'd probably want to add another power to another legendary somewhere, and and a lot of people I think would like that too. So it's a bit of a trade-off. It's not something that we're saying closing the door on or anything, but it's something that you know we always have to look at it from a resource point of view. All right, guys, I think we're 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 out of time, but uh, the good news is that we have a full hour for Q and A later on today. So thank you for coming, and see you guys in the sanctuary. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.